Welcome, welcome. As people are joining, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat and just put your name and affiliation so others know who's on the on this webinar. We'll get started in a minute or two. We'll let the, uh, more people are joining. Good morning, good morning, or good afternoon or good evening if you're calling in from different time zones is the case these days. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, I'm Kristen Daly, the Executive Director of Global Washington, the host for today. I am thrilled to be joined by three very distinguished speakers for this conversation on building and strengthening civil society. Um, as most of you know, Global Washington organizes our work around the sustainable development goals. And we look at a different issue each month. And this issue really came about thinking about the conversations that national governments have been having around the importance of democracy. And you may have heard even uh, President Biden talking about organizing a summit on democracies that he wanted to convene uh, this year or next year, and really showing the importance of what that means for civil society. And for Global Washington, we started thinking about this topic, and especially around our nonprofits, thinking about there's obviously the government construct of having a democracy. But there's also the concept of really what democracies mean for people living in that country and thinking about the components and the fundamental aspects of what makes a civil society and the, the social cohesion that is needed at the foundational roots to actually create a democracy. And we looked at our members and there are so many of our members that are doing just that. So we really wanted to shine the spotlight on more of the civil society grassroots community building that is essential to this concept of democracy. So that's what this month is all about. Um, you might have seen this week we pushed out some articles also about the World Justice Project and the Chandler Foundation. So if you haven't seen those yet, you should go to our website. Um, uh, there and you can learn more about this topic and uh, some of the members also that are doing this work. So today we're that is the topic of this conversation and I wanted to introduce the speakers and again if you're just joining feel free to put your name and affiliation in the chat. We'll have um, a conversation with you all of you we will have a panel discussion first and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And the way we're going to do Q&A today is there should be a tab at the bottom of your screen that is the Q&A tab. And we'd like you to type in your questions there. And then I will verbally ask those questions to the panelists and they can verbally answer as well. Feel free to interact also through the chat if you have uh, comments throughout the presentations or if you want to add uh, resources. If you know of a report, that's always helpful. Uh, we want to make this interactive as well. So um, with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers today. Um, first, we have um, Elena. Um, sorry, let me find my notes. And Elena bon Bonometti who is, hopefully I said that okay, um, who is the CEO of Tostan. And she's actually joining us today from Senegal in West Africa. Tostan is actually an African-based nonprofit organization. And Elena is an Italian national with 20 years of experience in Africa. And her expertise really does center around community health and economic empowerment. Elena is also the co-founder of Catalyst 2030, 
which is focused on joint action for systemic change to achieve the sustainable development goals. And if you know uh, anything about Global Washington, we're huge fans of the SDGs too. So we're, we're glad to have Elena leading that effort as well. You'll hear more about Tostan, obviously, from Elena today, but I wanted to call out that it does work in five uh, countries in West Africa and is really known for a community based trainings that really support, again, what we were talking about in terms of grassroots cohesion of communities around health and education and livelihoods. So we're thrilled to have Elena here today from Dakar. <laughs> uh, next, our speaker is Patty Curran who's the executive director of Partners Asia. And Patty has spent her career really focused on leading social justice uh, organizations and looking at bu business ethics efforts. She has experience both in nonprofits and for-profits. Uh, early on in her career, she was a Jesuit volunteer in Kathmandu. And then she also spent 15 years in Cambodia, really contributing to the fight against landmines and providing vocational training to landmine survivors. In 2010, she moved to Myanmar, where she really facilitated collaborative efforts of drafting a national strategic plan for the advancement of women. Um, and she's also worked, as I mentioned, in the private sector, working on social responsibility efforts and has a wide range of, again, the, the intersection between social justice and business ethics. So welcome, Patty. Thank you for joining us today. And the, our third speaker today is Katie Holtquist, who's the Director of Leadership Giving for Outright Action International. And Katie has more than 20 years of experience in nonprofit management and fundraising. And all throughout her career, she again has had this intersection of social justice activism both at the local, national, and international levels for different organizations. Her previous roles include roles with NPH USA, Passages Northwest, Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, Ashoka, and she's also worked for a US Senator from North Carolina. And uh, Katie's based in Seattle and has been a, a, a longtime advocate and uh, a leader in the Global Washington Network as well. Actually, Kristen, let me just stop you because there is no Democratic Senator from North Carolina and I just want to make it clear. I have not worked for a Republican Senator from North Carolina. I worked on a Democratic um, Senate campaign that was challenging one of uh, Jesse Helms. So ah. just to clarify for everyone. There, thank you. Thank you, especially for us in the in the Northwest that might not know the politics as well there. So um, thank you for that clarification. Important to point out. So let's get started with our, our conversation. Um, I'm gonna ask one question for all the panelists uh, to, to start and really get us grounded in this idea of what civil society building is all about. So can you describe the elements of what you think a healthy thriving civil society would be within the context of your work or your geography? Uh, Elena, we're gonna start with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, first of all, for having me and for associating me with such distinguished uh, uh, panelists. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to speak from Dakar, Senegal. Uh, you know, uh, as you have, as you can imagine, of course, my passion, my professional, personal light motive has been Africa. And so it's so important today that we elevate this discussion. And I really want to bring the African perspective in, into, into this conversation. So, you know, when I thank you for asking that question in a positive way, you know, we need positive role models. We need to think what is good. And then of course, uh, try to challenge and see what doesn't work. And then we can uh, of course improve eh? So when I close my eyes and I think about what is a thriving and healthy civil society, I really think about a village, a community partner at Tostan that is called Medina Yerufula. It's in Southern Senegal. And it, uh, it embodies really what it feels to me uh, a, a healthy and thriving civil, uh, civil society. So let me give you a little bit of background about Torsten work and let's then come back to, uh, to, southern, uh, to southern Senegal, so to the Medina Rofula. So the community empowerment program, our flagship program is really 
an educational journey for communities at the grassroots to really have a vision for their well-being and fulfilling that vision by bringing um, individual uh, actions in, and, and transform those into collective actions. So that program provides really tools and basic information to make informed choices about their well-being and how to access their well-being and actually also how to aspire to their well-being. Now, within that process, we have a governing body at the community level, which is called the Community Management Committee, that is really organizing the collective action at the grassroots uh, around uh, you know, health, education, uh, environment, so important uh, uh, this particular moment, and uh, also you know, governance, uh, economic empowerment. Uh, so those are the collective actions taken by you know, these community members that have, have access to empowering education. And then five years ago, we realized that that wasn't enough to, uh, to, to bring, to really create that conducive envi environment. And so we started training the elected officials that were represented those community members. And by the way, those community members started to run for office and being elected. And so we saw that really people were able to advocate for allocation of resources according to their needs and so that their agenda could be advanced with you know resources available and also by um attire by by yes by um by bringing resources from other sources so this is exactly what happened in medina rufula so uh a mayor that take the courage really to um, implement a leadership model in his village that was bringing people to the table, that was allowing people, in particular men, women, and children, to really sit together and to speak about what their well-being look like, what's their vision, and how a location of resources should happen according to that. And we have seen that when people are empowered to make informed choices and then they have the power also they, they they can be heard there is there is a space for accountability there is a space of for transparency and uh, uh, people own own that vision i'm i'm you know i was particularly impressed with medina rufula by the mayor cali Dusi, and the municipal council and the youth municipal council because there is a shadowing youth mayor at Medina Rufula today, uh, because they shown in particular during COVID, and we did a wonderful video that I'm going to share. Actually, my colleague Shirley will share on the chat box for you when you have a moment to take a look. We saw that those kind that those community that had access to empowering education that that had. Uh, had access to, uh, to to defining a vision for their future could go out and also empower others. So for example, during COVID, Medina Rofula, with very little means, with very little support that Tostan in particular, but other organizations could provide, went out and sensitized, you know, uh, hundreds of villages around them so that really infection rates were kept very low and in particular the most vulnerable really were informed about the virus and could know how to protect themselves. So we have seen really community members in particular elected officials taking this to the next level. And so we were so proud of that and we saw that again that is about resilience and to me that is the image of a healthy thriving civil society uh, people that have a vision that have access to education that is uh, really allowing them to make choices and allocation of resources and also really uh, resilient to, to the challenges and I, I, you can you know you can name the number of challenges that Medina Rufula has that are beyond COVID and so again we have seen how uh, this kind of model can really bring to positive outcomes at, at the grassroots level. That's great. Thank you for that real uh, concrete example that really brings it to life. So thank you for that too. Patty, can you tell us what, what you would think of for elements for healthy, thriving civil society? Sure. Um, for, for me, I think four, four main, main words come to mind. It's agency, equity, voice and resources. So that when community leaders and community groups are truly dedicated and trusted within their communities have these four these four components. Um, communities move from a situation of survival, you know, in the places and the communities where where all of us are are trying to 
to contribute to, um, to thriving. So how is it that we support our partners in, in, in that transition? I mean, despite the, the many, many obstacles and, and also just the, the need to recognize that local leaders who are well-resourced, who have a voice, who have, have a sense that equity is important and not just sort of taking whatever people in power or control are willing to offer them, that uh, there can be a paradigm shift in, in level of suffering and, the, and a sense of community members that they, they have a right, that they have right that they are entitled to doing more than just getting through this life um, on a shoestring, that sort of thing. So for me, it's it's about sort of the energy that local groups use not only to serve their communities um, in the experience of Partners Asia, but also to act on their the behalf of their communities in representing needs and the desires, aspirations of the communities, um, the authorities, whoever whoever that may be, and also to donors. Um, not necessarily just just the local governments, but in addition to that, external actors or stakeholders who are involved. That's great. Thank you, Patty. The agency equity voice and resources. I, I like that. Um, great. Katie, what, what, can, can you answer that question as well in terms of your definition of a thriving civil society? Absolutely. And happy pride, everybody. I'm Katie Holtquist and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm one of two outright staff members here in Seattle, my colleague Ami Bishop, who some of you may know is also on the call. Um, and I've been a Global Washington member for over 10 years, both with outright and previous organizations. And it's been an incredibly valuable community for me and for us. So I'm very happy to be here today, particularly because outright promotes inclusion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer people in the SDGs through our work at the UN and because we believe civil society is everything. Um, so for those who might be new to us, Outright has been protecting and advancing human rights for LGBTIQ people around the world for 31 years. We're headquartered in New York City with staff members in eight countries. And we exist because while the journey for L full LGBTIQ equality has far to go in every country, there are huge geographic disparities. Um, just a couple of examples, while 29 countries have approved marriage equality, in 67 countries, homosexuality is still criminalized and only five countries ban abusive so-called conversion therapy practices. And too many of our governments deprive us of full equality and too many in our societies reject and persecute us. So in order to fight effectively for LGBTIQ rights globally outright uses three essential and integrated strategies. The first is that we conduct and publish research because we need a global evidence base about experiences and issues our communities face in order to push for change. The second is we advocate for LGBTIQ rights at the United Nations and beyond because international pressure is essential to curb human rights violations and changes laws and policies. And Outright is the only LGBTIQ organization with consultative status and a permanent presence at UN headquarters. And third, um, most relevant for today, we support the grassroots LGBTIQ movement because we believe that the presence of strong queer and trans organizations and activists is the single greatest factor that produces cultural, social, and legal change. And we do that by providing training, technical assistance, and funding to hundreds of groups and advocates every year. Our model is entirely one of partnership, um, partnership with diplomats and governments, businesses, but most importantly with civil society organizations and human rights defenders. We don't parachute solutions from the outside, but we listen to and lift up our grassroots partners who know what their communities need. We help connect activists across regions, provide training when invited, connect them to halls of power and provide funding. Um, so just a couple of examples, we've brought hundreds of LGBTIQ activists to UN headquarters through our fellowship programs. We sponsor a week of advocacy around Human Rights Day every December with 50 to 60 human rights defenders. We have a religion fellowship program for activists who are working in regions with pervasively religiously motivated homophobia and transphobia. And last year we hosted a Beijing plus 25 fellowship for activists who are working in the intersection of women's rights and LGBTIQ rights. We also host an annual human, human rights conference out summit, which brought together over 1600 people from more than hundred countries last year. Another example is our research projects. Um, one of our recent projects looked at where LGBTIQ organizations can legally register worldwide and we found that in 55 countries, queer and trans organizations cannot register as such. They have to register as youth organizations or business organizations or some other category. And in 30 countries, we couldn't find a single LGBTIQ organization. So we're committed to incubating and supporting new organizations and strengthening ex existing ones. And then finally, 
as you can imagine, LGBTIQ people have been disproportionately and severely impacted by COVID. We've experienced significant loss of income and food, lack of access to healthcare, increased domestic and family violence, and scapegoating and other human rights abuses. And many of our organizations were and are still on the brink of survival. And we still see extreme need, um, especially in places where vaccines are not yet available. And we're oftentimes uh, rare, well, rarely, rarely reached and oftentimes explicitly excluded by traditional relief, relief efforts. So Outright launched a global LGBTIQ COVID emergency fund last year, and we've distributed $1.6 million to 177 organizations in 80 countries so far. And I think through all of that, what we've learned, um, or my, my, my opinion about what, what the most important elements um, to a healthy, thriving civil society for LGBTIQ people are, um, echo you know, what some of my co-panelists have already said, but first, that solutions must be driven locally by communities themselves. Second, many more support and resources are needed. Um, the LGBTIQ movement, for example, outside of the US is severely under-resourced. Um, according to our partners at the Global Philanthropy Project, all LGBTIQ rights causes outside the US and Canada combined for the rest of the world received $260 million in philanthropic support compared to $300 million for US and Canadian organizations. And by contrast, more than 6.2 billion over the last decade has flowed to oppose LGBTIQ and women's rights globally. So, and the third thing is that intersectionality matters. Um, we find that many of the LGBTIQ human rights defenders we work with do not only see themselves as queer activists, they are also women's rights activists, they're environmental activists, they're disability rights activists, they're anti-poverty activists, and they're activists for racial and ethnic justice. And Outright works intersectionally as well, particularly at the UN where we partner with other civil society organizations on a multitude of issues uh, because we have to and because we're stronger together. So for me, the intersectionality, um, more support and resources and locally driven solutions are the, the three main keys. Thank you, Katie. That was such a good overview and, and thinking about the elements in that way. And, and each of you talked about this idea that solution, solutions must be driven locally and Again, you're, all of you have that model. Um, Tostan, obviously, within the communities based there, headquartered in Africa, and both with Partners Asia and Outright, this idea of partnership, that you are there to support and, and foster those type of partners within, um, within the countries where you're, where you're working. So thank you for that, for that opening remarks, if you will. Um, Elena, I want to I want you to talk a little bit more about Tostan and your programs, especially the community empowerment program, which is really a human rights based approach. And, and you mentioned this a little bit, but talk about some of the unique challenges um, like COVID, like others uh, that you're experiencing in West Africa. Thank you, Christian, uh, um, for this. And, uh, you know, the community empowerment program has been a, a journey in itself. Uh, uh, committed to human rights. Eh? So the, the really what we intend to do at Tostan is really to inspire large scale movement, really uh, leading to dignity for all, but having human rights at the center of, um, uh, you know, the work that we do. But definitely it was a learning journey and we are really committed to learning. And actually the biggest learning are coming from failures, correct? So back in 1996, uh, you know, we were talking about women rights. Um, and, you know, that, that became a backlash, actually. That became one of the biggest failure. Uh, women, of course, were at the center of the work that we wanted to do, but men felt excluded. Men felt that we wanted to close doors. And in fact, we wanted to open doors to dialogue. So that is the first lesson. Uh, and, you know, in itself, the challenge it's really bringing people within. So inclusion and inclusiveness is really one of the core principles of the community empowerment program, which is holistic, which is inclusive, which is a curriculum that comes from a place of respect, of no judgment, but really takes stock of what is available and what the community as a whole can bring, can bring forward as an agenda because they choose to do so. And so that really putting the human rights instead of women rights in that back again in 1996 was a major shift for us and, and using that tool as a tool to bring the individual 
within the community, because in, in the countries where we work, the community, the social network reference is the, 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 the container of, uh, you know, any, any single decision and, uh, you know, what, what is, you know, what is really well-being for, for the community. So that was the instrument to bring roles and responsibilities. And that has been a really a major, it's a major, um, it's a major pivot, it's a major pillar sorry, of the community empowerment program. Then I will say that another important one is the terminology. And again, to go back to the challenge of working with human rights in this context is really that, you know, in some of these communities and then even at the, you know, at the local level, when you talk about human rights, people think immediately about something political. It's okay, there is a, a need to, uh, to, uh, to shake or uh, there is a kind of um, a revolution. Uh, so, you know, there is those concepts that brings to people feel feeling threatened uh, by this. And so we have learned that terminology is critical to advance this agenda. So we like to speak about the principle of human dignity. So many relate to human dignity in a way that, you know, is the same way we feel about human rights. The human dignity means the right to have a name, the right to have access to education, the right not to be discriminated against because of our um, beliefs or religious uh, um, values. So that terminology has been instrumental for Tostan to advance in a very respectful, respectful way and very sensitive way. And again, we have seen that everyone adheres to principle of human dignity, and that has allowed us really to, uh, to, to make a big, big step forward, even in the most conservative uh, areas. And that again, it's a pride uh, in, in the way we work, again, very respectfully with communities. Now, the third point that I want to make, and it's even so important, and it has been important for community members, but also for our staff, it is so important to align those human rights values, again, at the core of the, of the, of the model of the community empowerment program, because those are values, those are, uh, those are the principle of really in which people identify as a community and really discuss and reinforce those values and assess those values against practices uh, has been really a, an important piece of work in particular around social norms. And you might know that we are famous for the abandonment of uh, female genital cutting, child marriage, which are social norms. But you know those, those practices have been able to be abandoned. And by the way, I'm going tomorrow to a public declaration in the Futa, which is a very conservative area, where 60 communities are going to declare their intention really to abandon female genital cutting and child marriage. And that is possible because people focus on their values. And, and how have we gotten to that point? We, 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 we try to align human rights principles, so principle of human dignity to religious also and, um, and, uh, and religious and values and beliefs. And this has been so important, aligning them with the Quran, aligning them with uh, uh, Christianity. And we bring religious leaders to work with us because those are the agents that allow for change to happen. And I can tell you how this was a game changer for our staff as well, how much they are prouder of their work, because they feel really that what they are doing is pursuing principle of human dignity that are aligned with their religious values. And in the countries where we work, this is so important. So, you know, that is just a little bit of a sense of our journey with the, you know, challenges in working in this context, but also uh, allowing for really success to be driven by really what it matters and uh, not the way we call it and not the way we act, but really the way people are accepting and embodying and owning that, that, that dialogue. Yeah. That's great. I, I love that concept of thinking about it as human dignity and, and really as um, a different way of thinking about human rights that's, that, like you said, is more approachable, more universal, more uh, specific. So uh, I like that a lot. Um, Patty, I want to turn to you now. Um, again, I know Partners Asia has been working in Myanmar and with the coup and the crisis and the atrocities going on there. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about your work and the challenges of ensuring the safety of marginalized groups um, in Myanmar, throughout Southeast Asia even. Um, and, and how do you promote their work and strength in those communities um, under these conditions? 
Kristen, I, yeah, um, you'll have to give me the high five when I need to put things off because I think I could go on about this topic for about four days. Uh, Partners Asia has been working in, in Myanmar and along the border for, for over 20 years now um, and got our start with people who were interested in mindfulness and meditation and that has involved, uh, evolved into sort of a, um, yeah, a very large program with 85 grants to local leaders and, and their, their organizations every year, cross sector, unrestricted funding, multiple year commitments, that sort of thing. So if there was a time, um, I think in our history, for Partners Asia and this approach, it would be right now, because not only with, with the coup and the need to respond to the needs of human rights defenders of communities where airstrikes have just decimated their villages, 230,000 people now displaced, um, the situation is, is, is pretty dire. And, and still our partners get out of bed every morning to serve serve their, their communities. And, and the, the sort of litmus test for us in selecting partners um, has always been, are they trusted within their communities um, to, to um, engage people, to inspire people, to increase people's sense of hope for the future, to act as a, um, as a catalyst for change and to represent their communities to, to local leaders and, to, and within networks. COVID is also something, a, a challenge um, that is that is really hitting with the vengeance. I talked to a colleague just this morning in Chin State. Thousands of people have, have died or who have contracted COVID, the Delta virus, and there are um, 3 million vaccine um, vaccines in, in country now, um, which if given in two doses would, would serve about 2.8% of the population there. Um, because of the coup, um, the government hospitals have been shut down. Um, there's a lot of informal medical care that's taking place, and we've invested significantly in supporting uh, doctors and nurses who are, you know, having backpacks and going to treat the wounded, and now, you know, to whatever extent they can, treating people um, at home who have COVID. My colleague this morning said that they are now, um, the people who do go to private hospitals, the way that they're um, um, serving them is to put them on a pallet on the floor, which is the same thing that you take to have a body be cremated. So essentially people go to the hospital and, and they're waiting there to die and then to be to be taken. So the situation, and I, I, again, um, one, one story that's that's interesting um, and inspiring around, around the displacement was about a month ago, there was a really horrible weekend where about 85 people were gunned down during one of the demonstrations. And a lot of people fled to their neighboring state, Karin state. I don't, I don't know who's in, in the group who might know of the lay of the land, but Myanmar is um, the, the Burman majority, the Burmese people sort of occupy most of the central part of the country. And then there's a horseshoe around the country, which is comprised of all of the, the ethnic groups. And for the ethnic people, they've never really felt equity. They've never felt representation. And um, so there, there's been a, always kind of an, an us and them mentality. So when, when those killings took place in Bago, which is a Burman majority um, area, and people fled into the forest of Karen State, the reaction was, you know, what, what are you doing here? And why all of a sudden do you, you come to us for help when you've ignored us for, you know, this sort of stereotypes and, and putting everybody in the same box of people who have oppressed some of the ethnic groups. And the work of our partner in one case was really to sort of encourage people to be reminded that the suffering is, is cross boundaries. It's absolutely everybody here is, is suffering here. So that was that was a main, a main role that that, that particular organization um, played there. And so I guess the beauty of that story is really that our partners are really responsive and they pivot. And when I asked another partner, you know, how is it that you get out of bed in the morning now with this COVID crisis, as if, you know, COVID sort of, they are now where we were a year ago of not knowing how bad this is going to be, how, are, how can we contract it, um, will we survive it, this sort of thing. And in addition to that, you know, lay, lay in that there's a curfew and that there are arbitrary killings and torture and, you know, people who are arrested, people who are missing, that sort of thing. And, and our partners say for as long as those people, communities need us, we have to reach our potential, attempt to do everything that we can to serve them. So for Partners Asia, addressing that has really been um, saying yes to the needs that are identified in, in those communities and trying to resource them. So since the 1st of February, when the coup took place, We've, we've dispersed um, about $1.9 million in, in about 95 grants. So it's been really significant. And, and given that the, um, the infrastructure of the country has collapsed, there's no banking system, and we've really relied on informal 
um, transfers of, of funding, you know, get money into the country somehow and get it to these communities somehow. But because we've been there for so long and because we have worked solely with local leaders, we haven't been burdened by the bureaucracy that so many international organizations face that are registered with the government, that have to have everything cleared by the authorities, that sort of thing. So we really, it, it's really been, it's been a moment where, you know, somebody said, do you like your job? And I think more than ever before, because I really do feel like we have potential to serve to serve the communities that are that are most in need. Um, important to say too, related to civil civil society um, in Southeast Asia, just like in I'm sure in in many places in Africa and around the world, um, space is shrinking for for people to have those four pillars that I was describing earlier. And and um, COVID has really shown a light or magnified the systemic flaws and the drastic inequalities across across the country. Um, so that's been a challenge for for our partners um, and also for independent media. We do a lot of support to local um, citizen journalists, they call them, to sort of continue to get the story out. Another challenge that we face is that Myanmar has kind of lost the spotlight to all these other crises that are in the world. So it's really difficult for people there, particularly when they they feel like they've been a bit abandoned from the first place. You know that that there hasn't been. From the UN Security Council, um, any any action from ASEAN um, hasn't been any any um, follow up on any of the commitments that they made, which were sort of lukewarm even when they when they made them at the beginning. So our partners are just really really trying to hang in there. And and uh, Kristen, you asked me a few days ago, kind of what what are the main challenges for me? And for me personally, it is it is really just keeping my mouth shut and listening and serving, even though I wonder, you know, whether or not the work that people are trying to do to support the, the duly elected government um, that was elected in November. And um, some of our partners are just thinking that this could somehow be a blessing in disguise, a hide hideous disguise. But is it possible then that because of this, um, um, because of this opportunity, will there be more um, equity in education? Will kids, will there be a federalist system where kids who don't speak Burmese language or don't have access to tutors, that sort of thing, everybody has equal access and that's what they're working for. So it is, um, it has been, it has been an incredible privilege to serve the partners who we've, we've been working with. Um, I think I'll leave it at that to just, to just say that um, we, we believe deeply that supporting local leaders is the best, the best solution. Yeah. And uh, I, it seems like uh, you, I mean, you'd know this better than I, but it, that maybe the only solution, like thinking about how Myanmar is going to rebuild and, and find a path forward past this period of time, the, the, the grassroots civil society organizations are going to have to come together and, and be part of that solution. Um, can I make one, one more point, though, yeah. if, if you don't mind, and that, that is around um, the worry that our partners and our advisors have. So Partners Asia has um, seven, seven people who are our advisory council, and these people are top-notch human rights advocates and just warriors, and they're, they're the ones who kind of guide our strategy and we're able to meet with them raise regularly to bounce ideas off them. They have grave concerns about likelihood the international community is going to come in with a blueprint and co-opt the work they have been doing so tirelessly for the past year or you know more recently since the coup in, on, in February. And and what's what's it going to mean for the work that they're trying to do? So just a note of kind of general caution that we really do need to look at colonizing aid and, and also recognizing that local leaders are trusted within their communities to prioritize and, and to try to support them in addressing needs. And it shouldn't be a competition and it should be recognized. It's a really good point. So important for all of us to remember. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Katie, I want to turn to you. Um, again, as you said earlier, LGBTQ people are often excluded from mainstream civil society building positions of power and mechanisms for decision making. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit more and maybe give an example of ways in which including LGBTQ people and their challenges actually expand the traditional structures of civil society and why is this key to achieving some of the SDGs and specifically SDG 16 under peace and justice. Can you talk about that a little bit? I would love to, and I also could go on for four days. So please cut me off <laughs> if needed for time. Um, I'd love to highlight the work we're doing and especially our partners in the Caribbean where our movement is really burgeoning. 
Um, and I will just start by saying that the very existence and visibility of LGBTIQ people challenges traditional norms and structures. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But just to give a little context, while over half the countries in the region still criminalize same-sex relations under so-called buggery laws left over from British colonial rule since 2016, Belize and Trinidad and Tobago have overthrown those colonial legacies and cases have been launched by civil society and individuals in several other countries, as well as at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, of course, changing legislation alone does not lead to genuine inclusion of LGBTIQ people in society or change perceptions. And so the work obviously continues everywhere. Um, but I'm really happy to say that in recent years, the LGBTIQ community and civil society have grown in strength and number in the Caribbean. Um, numerous organizations have been formed and obtained legal registration and have been supporting their local communities and advocating for change and outright help launch the region's first transgender network, UC Trans, for example, and the first trans organization in Jamaica, among others. But in addition to supporting emerging civil society organizations, we work with partners on a couple of key issues in the region, including tackling gender-based violence and also um, particularly moving forward, working on gender identity recognition laws in the region. So I just wanna highlight a couple of collaborative projects um, related to those themes as examples. The first is that last year, UC Trans, the regional trans organization I mentioned and outright launched the first holistic survey to look at trans and gender diverse lives in the Caribbean. We had 119 survey responses um, from 11 countries, which were supplemented by interviews and focus groups in order to help provide context to realities facing the trans and gender diverse community in the region. And we, our research found that trans and gender diverse individuals identified really significant challenges to their well being, including things like legal and social discrimination related to the inability to change one's gender marker, employment discrimination leading to higher rates of unemployment, a lack of access to or discrimination in health services, which contributed to self-medication and no subsequent medical monitoring, and a lack of political will to recognize or end discrimination on the basis of gender identity. So we and our partners are gonna be using this data to promote the formation of legal gender recognition procedures, particularly through advocacy at national, regional, and international levels. The second example that I wanted to share is around gender-based violence, which is a phenomenon, of course, most often associated with violence perpetrated, perpetrated by men against women, but it's also the most common form of violence faced by LGBTIQ people. And what leads to gender-based violence are archaic perceptions of gender roles and appearances, toxic masculinity, and notions of how things should be. Um, anyone who doesn't fit somehow or challenges what's perceived as a norm can be a target and victim of gender-based violence. And of course, LGBTIQ people challenge traditional gender roles and norms by our very being. Our gender identities, how we express them, who we love and how we show it, these all challenge the assigned norms and expectations. So queer and trans people are often perceived as a threat and fall victim to harassment, violent hate crime, beatings, so-called corrective rape and other forms of gender-based violence that are designed to make us comply, conform, and in some cases disappear. We see in the Caribbean in particular, a culture of toxic masculinity that is pervasive and rampant violence against LGBTIQ people, which is exacerbated and legitimized by the uh, buggery laws, as I mentioned. Those laws uh, more often than not mean that LGBTIQ people who are victims of gender-based violence don't report it or seek help for fear of outing, stigmatization, or even imprisonment. So over the last three years, Outright and our partners have been implementing a project designed to tackle gender-based violence across the region and improve access to justice and services for LGBTIQ victims of gender-based violence. We've been working with partners in Antigua, Haiti, St. Lucia, Trinidad and, Trinidad and Tobago to found uh, the Frontline Alliance, Caribbean Partnerships Against Gender-Based Violence, which is a coalition. And since the project launched, we've held trainings with all of our project partners to increase their capacity an ability to collect data on gender-based violence and identify and analyze local legislation and opportunities for advocacy. We also published a comprehensive report, landscaping the situation across the region that's being used by civil society to raise awareness and advocate for legislative and policy changes. Our partners, our LGBTIQ partners have worked to form partnerships with other civil society organizations back to the um, principle of intersectionality that I talked about before namely women's organizations who also tackle gender-based violence and also some key external partners who work on gender-based violence 
um, or related issues in some way. So just a couple of examples of that. In Antigua, we worked with a liberal senator who is passionate about women's rights to increase her understanding of and engagement with LGBTIQ issues, and she's become a real ally. In Haiti, where violence against LGBTIQ people has been on the rise, our partners were able to engage with the police and legal professionals, quite literally setting up a lifeline for LGBTIQ victims of gender-based violence. In Trinidad and Tobago, our partners also engaged with the police department, and in St. Lucia, our partners launched a successful media engagement strategy to improve representation of LGBTIQ issues in the media and raise awareness amongst the general public about LGBTIQ people and the violence that we face. And we really think that this model has been effective because it brought partners from across different countries to work together on an issue that's of great concern at both the regional and at national levels. So they could share best practices and learn from and support each other. And while at the same time, the model has allowed for nuance at the country level and given space for our partners to adapt the material to their local context. So um, those are just a, a couple of examples of the work that, that is happening with um, our grassroots partners. And I'm so excited. It's just a really exciting region. There's so much um, organizing and growth happening on the ground there right now. It's going to be really exciting to see what happens over the next couple of years. That's so great. That's, that's great to hear such progress and, and change happening. And, and, and again, I love that Outright uses this uh, data and research based approach as, as even benchmarking and, and uh, revealing what's going on in certain contexts so, and, and to make progress. So that's fantastic. Um, great. So I have one more question for all the panelists, and then we're going to turn to the, the attendees. So if you have questions, um, you can go ahead and start putting them in the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen or start thinking about them, and we'll turn to those questions um, in a moment. Um, so the question for all of you also is just future thinking. Um, can you share with us your outlook for the future? Are you optimistic about this topic in particular, um, especially all of you have been talking about this very challenging time period and context uh, with COVID and uh, again in, in turmoil in, in, in Myanmar and different communities. So um, I, I'd be very interested to hear how you are feeling right now in terms of of the future, if you're optimistic or or pessimistic about um, what's going on in your communities. Um, Elena, we're gonna start with you. I would definitely say that I'm passionately optimistic and not because I'm that by nature, but because of what I see happening at the grassroots. And, you know, I mentioned Medina Rufula at the very beginning, we have hundreds of Medina Rufula actually, in the Gambia, in Mali, in Guinea-Bissau, in Guinea, in Senegal, in Mauritania, in Nigeria, where we now work. So I'm passionately optimistic because I see that when people are empowered to lead their way, to really, to access to those, even few, but those resources that are allowing them really to put resources, to put, a, traction and focus on what they think is important to them for their life, for their children, for the communities. I think change can happen. And what we have seen when, you know, we started really introducing um, the, the training curriculum for elected officials, we saw actually what was happening, what happened actually with the harmful practices, really people reinforcing values and abandon practices that they thought were not uh, really aligned with those values. And, you know, that work around social norms uh, has inspired us in this um, space of good governance. Actually, when we share with the elected official what their role and responsibilities were, they had, a, actually, we had an aha moment, but them themselves, uh, them, uh, them themselves, in the sense that they realized that you know, in some context, it's almost expected eh, for you to, to distribute, you know, public goods because, you know, it's your family, because it's your community. So you're in a position to do good for them. It's, it's somehow expected to do so. But when people together accept that that is not, that is public good, that that is meant to go to education, that is meant to go to health, then the principle of transparency and accountability come to the front and become 
accepted and even expected practices. But that is a change that happened again when people have access to the information and then they have the chance to discuss what, what is expecting from them and what is can what what can what is the interest in really pushing forward a common agenda that has been discussed and, and, and owned. So I think it's critical that that change starts at the grassroots. I think what we have said, and my colleagues said it uh, so eloquently, uh, giving power to people that know what, the, what their challenges are, first of all, and what the solution can be, and giving powers to those uh, leaders, because we need leaders, eh? but we need proximate leaders. We need leaders that listen, that understand. And in the countries where I work and I've been working, I've seen leadership listening, and I've seen also leadership that um, has had different agenda, parallel agenda. And so I think um, I'm optimistic when I see that there is new leadership coming from the grassroots, and I think that leadership is able uh, to make changes. It's wonderful, and let me bring in the conversation the sustainable development goals. Uh, these, uh, uh, you know, elected officials really speaking the sustainable development goals languages. It's like that connection from local to global. You know, you see how things at the grassroots can influence the global agenda, and you know, and it's so powerful. And uh, and and I think we need really. And what we are seeing in terms of funding shifting to this kind of initiative, I think it's me. It's inspirational to me. There are people that understand that it's time to give money in the hands of people that are going to use them. Where, how they think it's uh, more appropriate, how they think is more relevant to them to make that change happen. So I'm passionately optimistic, Kristen. Thank you. That's so great. And it's so wonderful that, that you bring that passion to your work. That uh, makes um, the work so much more meaningful. And, and um, I'm, I'm sure it's, it, it's meaningful for you. So, um, Patty, I'm going to turn to you as well. How are you feeling about the future in the context of your work in this topic? Well, I'm much more optimistic listening to listening to Elena. Now, mm -hmm. I, if I would have gone first, I would have said I'm not so optimistic. And then I think, oh, man, I'm hanging around with you for the rest of my life. I, I am optimistic in that it is a privilege to be friends with, to be working with uh, leaders who we're working with who are absolutely tireless and, and determined, as I, as I mentioned earlier. I'm also optimistic because part of the work that Partners Asia has been working on, you know, before, before the coup hijacked most of our day and nights was really to try and attempt to support a shift in philanthropy so that philanthropists see themselves as allies in, in, a, in supporting systemic change and supporting addressing injustice and when I, this, these opportunities that I've had to be in conversations like this gives, gives me a moment to really think about how the possibilities that we have as we move from sort of the traditional models of donor and benefactor of charity and recipient, that sort of thing, those power dynamics, I get really, really excited about that. And I also, I also get excited about the possibility of, of being a conduit um, between um, our, our, the people who support our organization and the people in the communities whose, whose lives are, are better, or who have access to resources that they so desperately need. So I, I'm optimistic uh, um, in terms of sort of the socio-political context in, in Myanmar kind of remains to be seen how this is going to play out. I don't think anybody knows yet. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm betting on, on the partners who haven't who haven't stopped. And interestingly, I've sort of shifted from, I'm, I'm a mother of three children, and I'm also a bossy friend to people. And the partners who we work with, I've been saying to them, oh, you really should take a break, you know, get away, work-life balance. And they cannot do that. So I, I've, I've shifted my thinking to think, right, they're not doing that. So when you get on the phone, don't say how many hours of sleep did you, did you, did you sleep last night? It's really like, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for the work that you're doing and how can we support you? And that gives me energy. So the way that I see it too is that there's so much darkness around and it's not only in, in Southeast Asia where I mean, Thailand is also facing um, authoritarian regime as well. It's, it's not an easy time in any of the places where Partners Asia is, is working, but it really is when, when we support one another in the space of solutions and, and of, um, of encouraging people to hang in there, to be hopeful, it can kind of keep the darkness at bay. 
it's almost like you have to develop this muscle of optimism. You don't, Elena, but the rest of us do, just to sort of decide that I'm that I am going to be optimistic, and, I, and I'm not going to bring people down by by thinking, oh my gosh, what's the worst possible scenario here? I just feel privileged, and when you feel privileged, you're optimistic. I think. Yeah, I don't think any of us would be in the work that we are in if we didn't have this this drive for optimism and and like you said, um, this sense of privilege and and honor of working with with people that are in these situations. So um, that's that's a great way to think about it. Um, Katie, how are you feeling about the future? I feel mixed about it. Um, you know, on the one hand, backlash has been on the rise and the space for civil society organizing and freedom of speech has also been shrinking in many places as part of a larger trend that we see towards nationalism and traditional values. Um, you know, there's been a rise of anti-gay propaganda laws and crackdowns on freedom of assembly. I mentioned our 2019 um, or 2018 right to register report, which found the ability to organize is severely limited in many places. A um, couple of examples uh, in Egypt, four years ago, dozens of people were arrested at a concert after waving and standing near a rainbow flag. Um, in Chechnya, you probably have heard that dozens of gay men have been arrested, detained, tortured, and in some cases killed without any investigation or action. Just this month, 44 people in Uganda were falsely accused of attending a gay wedding, arrested and charged. Last week, Hungary's parliament passed legislation to ban content in schools deemed to promote homosexuality and gender change. And we're fighting with um, civil society partners in Indonesia right now. Uh, because members of parliament there are trying to pass a bill that would mandate conversion practices for anyone suspected of being um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. That said, I am hopeful, <laughs> not only because I'm an optimistic person by nature, but because despite the challenges in the last few decades, we've seen incredible legal and social progress for our community all, all over the world. Um, just in the last 10 years, 15 countries have decriminalized homosexuality, including India. Um, with a unanimous decision from their Supreme Court in 2018, which impacted more than 1 billion people. 16 countries have enacted uh, a marriage equality in just the last five years. Um, in 2012, Argentina passed the most pioneering gender identity recogni recognition law in the world that permits transgender people to self-determine their gender. And in 2019, the World Health Organization removed being transgender as a mental disorder from its international classification of diseases. Even though there are still 30 countries where we can't find LGBT, any LGBTIQ organization, that still means that in 164 out of 190 countries, we could find people who are organizing in some really, really tough places. Um, and I think the last example I'll give is one that my colleague shared with me this morning when I asked her what gives her hope. Um, she's our Africa program officer and has been working on a project with partners in um, three countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to combat conversion therapy, um, conversion therapy practices. And she said that what gives her hope is that our civil society partners, what they and we are doing together to change hearts and minds. And the example she gave is in Nigeria where we have been able to convene 15 interfaith religious leaders to learn about LGBTIQ issues and um, you know, have an openness to learning and, and possibly changing in what is an extremely homophobic and vol volatile environment. So I would say today, even in the toughest places, we have more opportunities than ever to advance um, our movement. It might be going slowly, but it is moving forward everywhere. Um, but that said, we, we need more investment. Uh, we are working really hard to identify new sources of support for our partners. And we have a goal of establishing an LGBTIQ organization in every country on the planet. Um, but it's gonna take all of us. So um, I am hopeful and I, I hope that we will all be able to continue working together. No, that's, that's great. That's good. I mean, it is good to be um, cautiously optimistic, I think in, in our work as well as, as we know the realities, be a realist in, in some of this. And your model is so good at, in terms of, of establishing those locally based organizations um, that, that are unique to each country. So um, it's fantastic. Um, so we're gonna open up to questions from the audience. And again, you can put them in the Q&A. You can even put them in the chat if you can't find the Q&A button. Um, but as you're doing that, um, I wanna go back to, um, Patty, you, you mentioned this, and this is an, a, a topic um, for the panelists and for people on the call as well. Um, this kind of shift in mentality of, 
funders in terms of, of becoming allies. And again, Partners of Asia is unique in that, that that's how you started and that having these, these partnerships with local organizations is fundamental to your model. But can, can you talk a little bit more about that of just what you've seen as a, as a trend um, over the past maybe 10 years? How, are you seeing other funders coming around? And do you think COVID has, has changed the, the way funders are approaching um, the, the work that they want to fund? All good questions. I um, way that partners. One, one example I'm thinking as I was listening to you, an illustration of this is that one of our donors has been supporting a a, a, um, a center for people living with a, HIV/AIDS, and um, every year, sizable contribution. It's been amazing. And after the coup happened, um, or it was actually during, during during the COVID time, before so before February. Um, they wrote to me and they said, how's this organization doing? And so I checked in with the organization, our partner, and said this donor, you know, who's been supporting you is wanting to know, are you doing okay? And, and the, the leader of the organization said, we are actually, you know, we don't need anything right now. We'll let you know. And that's the beauty of, of getting to work with the partners that we, we have. It's not like, oh, I better grab that if there's a chance to grab something, they might not come back again later. But when I when I spoke to the donor, and here here's the shift. When I spoke to our 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 donor, I said, you know, I, I talked to her, and she said, no, thank you, we don't need this money now. But what you could do is you could send her the money anyway, and say you're probably going to need this. Could you just use it as as a gift? We're thinking of you, and and you might need to do that. So sort of shift this to sort of focus on this trust based philanthropy. There's a fantastic. Bay Area based organization and you're nodding your head, Kristen, you've probably run into them, trust based philanthropy. They 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 are speaking the truth in a in a wonderful way. And I think more and more when our our supporters, those who invest in Partners Asia work, have an opportunity to think about their involvement other than we're asking them for a contribution. Um, it's more, will you join us? Will you, this is what we're trying to do. Will you please be a part of this? And will you please think about um, sort of contributions that you can make and be curious about this partner and listen to them. And could you, for example, one thing that we do is try to set up Zoom calls since COVID and, and just have the partners speak for themselves and ask our supporters, just participate and, and, and listen and, and, and help the partner to be more confident and, and articulate and help the donor to sort of see for themselves these connections and the shared humanity that we have with one another that really brings, brings us all together. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Kristen, or not, but it, it really, it's all a part of this shift where um, in, in this comes a certain power and an, an energy and a connectedness that really, it, it helps our partners to feel much more recognized and, and, cred and they're credible and they're legitimate and, and as decision makers and, and drivers of change. So this is what we're trying to do. There, there are several, and if, if people are interested, I can give some links to that, but several organizations that we're working with in our Weaver work so, um, and that is trying to build, building coalitions and communities of practice that can look at, you know, colonizing aid essentially, and and trying to see what we can be doing differently if if we're um, if we're really if we're really going to be true to the idea that we want to see a, a better future for in the world, you know, transformation and social good. That's great. No, that that is really interesting. Um, and it does seem that there are funders that are that are really looking for this. And I don't know if it's generational or with uh, younger donors coming, looking for a new type of involvement, um, that it is more walk with us, be a partner. Um, but there does seem to be a whole movement in global development towards this as well. Elena, did you want to jump in on this topic too? Yeah, thank you. I think what Patty said was resonating so much uh, uh, with me and what I've seen uh, happening uh, uh, for Torsten and Torsten partner communities. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we really in a truly, in, you know, Torsten way, we really ask our communities, what are the ideal partners uh, uh, in, uh, you know, that you, that we should bring to the table, you know, because we want to choose uh, the people we partner with. And they said, you know, we love people that come, 
they really are curious about what, you know, what are our challenges, how we find solution to those. They're really engaged in a conversation. They really, you feel there is trust in the first place, eh? that we can be open, you know, and have a conversation like Patty said that, you know, we don't need anything right now, but we are happy that you're inquiring about us, you know, that you're asking, what do we need? And so starting from that, really, we, we pushed our reasoning even further in terms of really starting with a partnership and when we meet a new partner when we see a new opportunity what what are the values that are bringing us to the table because i think there needs to be that value alignment and again it starts with trust with the respect we really the curiosity of understanding what the other is going through and what are the solution um, that are most appropriate to you know to those challenges and so we had with that lenses we have found amazing partners that have been able really to foster innovation, to really foster uh, new ways of doing programmatically at Tostan, so that ultimately really can respond exactly to the needs of, of those communities. And we are so proud of our partners. And those are the partners that really are truly in a co-creation spirit. They want to participate. And I understand when you want to invest, you want to know, you want to see, you want to see the results, you want to inquire. That's good to me, you know, asking questions, being curious, it's good. But then asking and assuming that people are going to respond what you want or what you need and you need to have your framework, that, that is not a co-creation. And so we really, again, we are having wonderful experiences in terms of relationship, smaller and bigger. The, you know, e they are equally important when we really sit together at the table in a true, true, really co-creation space. And I think, again, I see many, many more coming that way because they feel more fulfilled in that relationship uh, uh, themselves. So, you know, welcome to this new way of giving where generosity is really transformational and transformational for both the parties, those who give and those who receive. And that's really wonderful to see. That's great. And and even I've heard from, from Global Washington members that they've said no to some funding or some donors saying that this isn't going to help us advance our model. And, and being Absolutely. able to, to turn that away, I think, makes a huge statement in, in global Absolutely. development. That is the moment where you see, okay, what are the values we stand for? We say no, what is the reason? And uh, we had personally at Tostan a wonderful experience by saying no, because then people felt, oh, why, why are they saying no? Let's go and see. And so people came to Senegal to see and understand why were we saying no. And then a wonderful relationship started because really people wanted to understand deeply where, where that no was coming from. So absolutely saying no, it's very important as well. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, Katie, do you have a comment on this too? Um, I was just going to say, you know, it's it's hard for me to comment on this without um, acknowledging, uh, you know, our own scene, Seattle, Mackenzie Scott, who has just, you know, exploded the landscape in terms of trust-based philanthropy. She's not the only one, um, first one, only one, you know, not more important than other people who are doing it, but the scale on which she's doing it is is really quite incredible and um, the trust with which she is asking grantees and partners to you know take large general operating grants and do what they know how to do best is really inspiring and i hope will in will influence other funders to follow that model as well um, i also see uh, if some of you may know uh, the work of Social Venture Partners International, and they have launched a new reimagining giving um, model that changes the way, changes their model and the way that they've been thinking about connecting philanthropists to um, to justice and equity movements and causes around the world. So, and we personally at Outright have really seen, as I mentioned, with out summit our virtual um, well in the past it wasn't virtual, but our vir virtual human rights conference and. Um, other, we, you know, we launched an OutTalks webinar series and an Outright TV video and podcast series. And the great thing was, you know, we really were have been able to connect people more than we ever could before. And I, I see that being beneficial to our partners, um, our civil society partner organizations, and also to donors to actually learning more, engaging, listening to, and trusting um, the partners that we're asking them to support. The only caveat to that that I would say is that, you know, the activists that we work with, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure my other panelists and everyone else who's in this call, they are so, I mean, you, you said it, Patty, they are so busy. 
and there's sort of an expectation that they make themselves available to speak, you know, to connect with or speak at various conferences or, you know, on, on various panels and workshops and things like that. And I think that we need to absolutely get in the habit of compensating them for their time, you know, because they, they just, they don't have time. They, they need to make those connections, but they don't, they can't go away from the work that they're doing that often without, um, without their time being recognized. So I just want to make a little push for that. You know, we, we try to offer, we started a new policy around offering, um, you know, encouraging those who might invite us to, to do a presentation and include our partners, compensate them, or if not, we, we will provide a speaker fee to them because we think that their time is valuable. That's a really good point, Katie, and that's something obviously Global Washington has, has speakers and, and panelists all the time and something we've been thinking about. And for others that are small nonprofits like Global Washington and might not have a lot of resources for speaker fees, We've been trying to again get sponsorship or get or talk to even a corporate sponsor for a specific event saying we have this amazing speaker we'd love to bring in and we'd like to compensate them. So I do think that's and and even again for smaller organizations, um, it doesn't have to be the the ten thousand dollar speaker fee. It's it's it just showing the value of what you can contribute and trying to 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 build that in. I think is really important. You would be surprised at how many companies will call us and ask for, you know, a speaker from some, a, a grassroots speaker from somewhere, and they don't, they don't want to compensate them for their oh, time. Really? So it's, it's, it's frustrating. But I think we can all, we can all um, try to set a different expectation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's a really good point. Um, I want to ask another question too. This is this this conversation about. Uh, funding and the relationship is, is really interesting. And in my view, it's democratizing the philanthropy in a lot of ways. And um, so getting back to kind of thinking about civil society and uh, democracy building too and in that, um, can you uh, touch a little bit more on the communities that you work with? Do they have trust in their government? And I know it, it, it depends. On, on where and, and who and what, but in general, is there a, a, a trust that government policies will come through or that there's there's some um, supported mechanism or or is there a chasm <laughs> there? Um, and, and Katie, you're shaking your head. I, I thought, well, let's start with you and then <laughs> we'll, we'll go to others. Well, of course it depends, right? But like, in general, my first response is no. <laughs> um, and that's part of the reason why we started, uh, you know, we, we, we leave the local organizing to our partners, but we really invested in expanding our work at the United Nations over the last 10 or 15 years, because um, it's, it's somewhere that they can go for redress when their governments do not include them, you know, respond to our communities, criminalize our communities, et cetera. And so um, I think that people, I'm sure Global Washington members do, but a lot of people here don't, you know, don't have the best, um, don't understand what the United Nations does and its importance. But the truth is that it's incredibly important for the human rights defenders that we work with. And so, um, but yeah, I would just say that, you know, we, in general, no. <laughs> and, um, but they're working on it, you know, they're, that doesn't mean that they don't, that they don't engage. They're working at local levels, municipal levels. Um, we have a huge project in the Philippines working with partners to train um, barangay, local barangay officials, police, and other local civic officials um, to, to become basically more culturally competent around the issues of the community, more, more inclusive. Um, and we've been working with the mayor of Quezon City, who's an ally and partner on that for many years. A lot of other examples at local, um, national levels. We, we're not, they won't stop doing that, but it is oftentimes an uphill battle. And, and Elena or Patty, do you wanna answer that as well? I, I'm, I'm taking this from an angle of the education sector because eventually we are a school, a non-formal education, and we like to talk about empowering education. 
So, you know, I, I see the national education systems uh, focusing on accessibility in the countries where we operate are somehow lacking really and, and collapsing almost and really failing to prepare youth in particular. I'm thinking about children and youth, uh, you know, being prepared for their future to become engaged citizen, to be able to really fuel that thriving and healthy civil society. So um, I think, you know, when parents and children see that after going to school, they don't get a, a, a minimum level of writing and reading and, you know, numeracy skills, I think they, they, I think they feel that their governments are failing to provide for what seems to be basic, uh, basic rights or basic foundation for the future. And that's why, you know, I think, um, of course, there is hope, as we said, we are optimistic and hopeful that um, uh, and, and things are advancing. But though in the short term, I think there is need for alternative solutions that bridge somehow those gaps. And that's why I think, um, you know, um, community driven initiative that are addressing maybe those short, more short term challenges in terms of having access really to to enough information on education that is allowing to have you know a future to have a vision for this future and i'm thinking about youth in particular because we have seen from recent i don't know if you follow the news in west africa really a lot of civil unrest but coming from youth really from that um from that sense of really the government failing to providing for basic uh, uh, for basic needs for them to to thrive and and I think that, of course, fuel a lot of the immigration and brings other, you know, other kinds of problems uh, to the table. So, um, yeah, this is what I think. Uh, you know, um, I would like to add uh, from that particular education lens. Right. Yeah, and building trust in government is um, it can't hope happen overnight. It, there's got to be a, a long term trend of government support in order to build that trust, which, which, like you said, in some places is not happening. Um, Patty, do you want to comment on this? And I know Myanmar is, is a unique situation, but um, you can talk about Myanmar or other, other places in Southeast Asia. Yeah. In, in Myanmar, no. There's absolutely no, no in, in inter interaction, engagement with the junta. And people think that that would be a very bad, toxic decision if you, if you even go there. Um, Conversely, though, on the Thai border, where we've had these partnerships for many, many years, there are local authorities, like like you referenced, Katie. Um, there are, it's a different story when you have a personal connection to people. When when the displaced people, the, the migrant workers, the refugees have gotten to know Thai, Thai authorities, and there might be a really, really horrible um, um, protocol that comes from the central government and. Sometimes local authorities sort of look past that and continue to, to make things possible. So our partners are really relying on the relationships that they've had for a long time with, with those those authorities, particularly along the border. That's a really good point. And uh, I mean, I've heard from other members and 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 you all as well that um, some of your work is um, flourishing almost in, in spite of the government wherever they are, either in usually more national. And I've heard that often too, that local governments um, are, are different in certain countries. So um, no, I think it's a really important important piece of your work. Um, so the uh, maybe we have, we have time for a few more questions. Here's one also from the audience, going back to kind of the, the, the funding aspect that um, says, we know your important work, you requires lots of resources. Um, what are, some of the things that funders can do to best support your work. Um, Katie, do you want to address that? If you can think of, of uh, and again, it could be more of the funder relationship that we um, talked about, but is there, is there um, besides funding, is there something that, that funders can do to best support your work as well? Katie, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think some of this we've already talked a little bit about, but as far as funding itself goes, um, using that trust-based philanthropy model, looking at making general operating grants, looking at making multi-year grants, um, trying to bring a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging lens to your grant making or your giving um, as an individual. 
you know, even I know I do that even my, in my own monthly giving, you know, thinking, thinking about that. Um, uh, list just, I mean, it's the, for me, it's the basics, you know, being, being willing to listen and learn, um, about an issue, you know, that's a lot of what we do is educating, educating. That's a lot of what I do is here in the U S especially because our programs are all international, just educating donors and other partners here in the U S who want, who don't really know exactly what's going on, but care and want to do something to get involved. Um, and I think what Patty said, you know, as well, looking, looking to local, we've all echoed this, but looking to local, local investing locally in, um, local leaders and solutions. You know, I always tell people it's since I've been working in the global development sector, like find, get, you should be involved in the local community here in Seattle, if that's where you are, wherever you're, wherever you are, do, you should be doing something to be involved locally and find something that you can get involved in globally and trust local, trust those local leaders to know what is gonna work best in their context. Um, so back, yeah, back to those basics for me. And um, I have, some other resources specifically, I put one in the chat, but I have some other resources specifically around L the LGBTIQ funding landscape, not, not only in general, which is what I put into the, into the chat, but also around um, humanitarian relief related to COVID and how that is reaching or mostly not reaching um, LGBTIQ communities. So I'm happy to share that with anyone who's interested. That's great, Katie. Thanks. And and funding locally is is really important, both as you said, within your your own domestic residency, um, and also globally. And that's why I really admire groups um, such as Partners Asia and Outright, who are headquartered in the U.S. and have kind of that access, but support partners that are local. There, I have heard from philanthropists that maybe they can't find a local organization in the, in the um, countries where they want to support. And they can do that through organizations um, such, as, such as U3. So it's a good way to support local organizations as well. Um, Patty or Elena, do you wanna comment a little bit more on how best funders can support you? Patty? Sure. I, I think stay engaged, um, whatever your, whatever tugs at your heart, whatever cause it is that you're most interested in be well informed in that area, be curious about it, encourage curiosity among other people, host to, you know, make chicken curry and, and invite people over to sort of learn more about whatever the topic is that you're you're interested in, but just like have have the discipline and the muscle to stay engaged when when something is compelling to you and, and stay with it, I would say. Also, yeah, you know, fund related to the local local leaders, fund them directly when you can. I mean, when 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 the 501c3 tax deduction is not an issue for you, forget about organizations that are registered. Send send the money to them. These these we people fund me or or whatever. And I think yeah, we'll 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 support you in identifying those. Call me if if you want to know who who you could send support to directly, and happily give you the names of some really stellar partners who we're working with. But yeah, mostly just um keep at it, you know, just have this be a part of our identities as people who care about more than what's right in front of us. Yeah, that that's so important, especially, I mean, as, as Katie said, I do think that a lot of people um, have shifted some of their funding and, and to follow their passion, right? And in the past year, especially around uh, BIPOC communities here in the United States, social justice movements here in the US or COVID response, it's so critically important, but it doesn't have to be an either or. You can continue both locally and globally and, and continue that, which I really appreciate. Um, Elena, do you wanna add something? Yeah, I just wanted to echo in party on this in the sense that you know I've seen now more funders willing to go directly to the community. And of course, that's wonderful, in particular when we feel that the community is empowered to receive directly. Eh? So that's wonderful. And one case, um, and that is also uh, the second point I wanted to make, that is also an entry point for innovation, you know, because sometimes you do, you have, you know, you have your set commitments and you continue and, you know, there is a routine and there's sometimes no space to stop, <laughs> to think, to bring in new ideas and to really kind of brainstorm, strategize and et cetera. So, you know, the, um, uh, the point, so I have a guest here, sorry, my son. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so the point I wanted to make is during COVID actually, you know, just after COVID, uh, one of our partner uh, asked us, what, what can we do even more? You know, we had already some recovery funding. So prevention funding, recovery funding, what can we do more? Can't we just give cash to people? And we said, you know, we don't do that normally, but why not? Let's try because the, the, the idea was to reach the most vulnerable. So we engage in something that we don't normally do, but eventually, uh, you know, we are, we are learning, we are observing as we had two waves of cash transfer, non-conditional, of course, to the most vulnerable in selected communities. And again, the communities was the one to decide, is the one to decide who are the most vulnerable ones. Eh? So it's a community managed kind of cash transfer program, and we call them micro grants. Uh, that is really allowing the most vulnerable, normally female, female only um, uh, head household, headed household, sorry, to, to really, you know, survive. Eh? So we are learning from this experience. Uh, I, you know, I can't wait to see the results on how people have used uh, those resources and what is that experience or innovation telling us? Because I think, you know, we should go all the way and eliminate all kind of costs that are there, you know, they're not hidden, they're just there, that there are intermediary costs that maybe don't need to exist. So just give money to those who really need it, and they know best how to use that. And the same way we feel empowered by giving, being given operational support in the way we, you know, we want to use it. I think communities feel empowered that they are able to decide 100%, you know, what they can do, how and when. And so, I look forward to see the data from the experience in southern and northern Senegal, and really can't wait to integrate a new, uh, new, you know, this new element into our program if that is shown, and I'm sure it will. It's shown to be successful for communities' well-being. Again, I would love to just um, echo that um, both both points that you're making, Elena. That um, we also have seen that through some of our grantees for our emergency fund that we're. Have, have been making direct um, payments to members of the community and deciding who's gonna get it and for them to use however they need. And I'm also excited to hear the reports that come back from them and I'm sure it will be successful and very necessary um, at this time. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to say in terms of philanthropy right now is, I'm sure no one on this call needs this reminder, but um, I just feel like I need to keep saying it over and over again that the pandemic is not over. Um, the colleague that I mentioned that I spoke to this morning, our Africa program officer was telling me that Uganda is in the middle of a 40, I think like 40, 45 day um, total lockdown right now that is still going on. And I don't think that everyone, sh again, sure our community, but I don't think that most people here really understand how dire the situation still is in, in many places. And so um, in terms of philanthropy, I would just say like in the very short term, um, continue to prioritize giving that is tackling the very immediate suffering that's happening because of COVID, because we still find that that is really the biggest um, challenge and issue that our partners, of course, all of their other work is still go ongoing, but that is the biggest obstacle and it's, it, isn't, it isn't resolved yet. They're still in the middle of an extremely deep and um, protracted crisis. Mm -hmm. Such an important point. And, and some are not even in the middle. It's, it's some countries are just starting this too, and that it, it's going to be years. And it is something that we feel some weight has lifted here in the United States. But again, um, you know, I think people realize, but it's important to say again and again that we're not safe until everyone's safe, that this is a global pandemic and people should think about it in a global way, and that it's not just a health crisis. It's definitely causing, as, as you all have said, even a, even worse closing of public space and, and human rights in some ways, definitely economic crisis. So um, such an important point to keep in mind. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I knew it would be with these three organizations and these three speakers. So such a privilege to spend this time with you. Um, thank you all from the audience for joining today. We are going to um, 
put this conversation on a, a, a web page that's unlisted. So if you like the link, we're um, happy to provide that. I'll check in with the speakers. We wanted to make sure this was a safe place. And if there's anything they wanted edited out, we can do that before we uh, route the recording. But um, thank you again for joining. Thank you all. Um, stay in touch with Global Washington. We'll be doing again, other uh, even related topics to this next month, we're looking at, uh, again, one of the SDGs around gender equity, around um, leadership and uh, getting more agency. So very related to this conversation as well. So continuing, um, continuing this conversation. Thank you again, um, everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Pat you. and Katie. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.